Hello, 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 and welcome to the wonderful Wednesday broadcast of Miss Hope's Reading Hour. So glad to be here with you all. If this is your first time here, I am Miss Hope. I'm so glad to be here with you all to read some awesome books and just to hang out with you guys for a while. It is almost the end of the school year here in Philadelphia. So we got two more days. Well, the students have two more days. The adults have to go back on Monday. Not exactly sure what we're going to do on Monday. Probably make sure our classes are all cleaned up and stuff. Because we were doing like the hybrid. Some people were in school and some people were at home. All of my class was at home. But some of the staff was in my room. So we got to make sure that the room is all put together to make sure that they can clean and sanitize over the summer. So that in September we're ready to go. Okay, but I know that many of the students are super excited that we only got two more days of school. Now today at my school, I was so sad. I did not get to go, but today was the eighth grade graduation. So congratulations to the whole eighth grade class of Martha Washington School in West Philadelphia. We are so proud of you all. You have you soldiered through the yet last year and a half with um, all of these changes and you still graduated and you did awesome. You did standardized tests when you thought you weren't gonna have them. You did all of these things and you soldiered through, persevered, okay? And one of our books actually today is about making it through tough things, okay? So we are so proud of you all and we look forward to you doing awesome, awesome things when you get to high school, okay? So with all of that being said, today on our wonderful Wednesday broadcast, I had these two books. And I was wondering, well, when would I read these books? Because, of course, you know, I like to have fun with you guys, read some silly books, read books about awesome people. But these two books, like, I just kept looking at them. And I was like, we need to read them somewhere. And I didn't even think that both of them would go together. But today, it's been a little rainy outside. It's been super hot. Yeah, it's still super hot here. I think it's supposed to cool down tomorrow. It's been super hot here in Philadelphia. Probably where you are, it's been super hot there too. Um, but it was kind of rainy. You know, the sun is shining like behind the clouds. But it's been kind of rainy, kind of cloudy. And so, hello, hello, um, you um, Facebook user, unfortunately, Facebook users, I can't always tell who you are. Hello, David. I'm so glad that you're on. Um, and so I wanted to read these two books because sometimes, even though it's a wonderful Wednesday, we may name it Marvelous Monday, Terrific Tuesday, Wonderful Wednesday, Thankful Thursday, Fabulous Friday. But we might not always feel that way even if we give these awesome names to an awesome, you know, adjectives for these days. And so I wanted to read a little bit about, you know, when you have to go through a tough time and sometimes when you aren't feeling quite so great, okay? So I'm gonna show you those books in a moment just to let you know you have an opportunity Guess what your opportunity is, my older ones, my adult ones, even my young ones. Because, you know, y'all get allowances and things. You might want to put your money towards the Miss Hope's Reading Hour Library. Because very, 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 very soon, we're going to have to make an order for some more books. Because we need more books, okay? So... In order for you to donate to Miss Hope's Reading Hour Library, guess what you can do? You can go on to Cash App. 
and donate any amount that you want to donate. You can donate $5, $1, $50, $100, however much you want to donate, okay? And every bit of money that gets donated goes to Books for Miss Hope's Reading Hour Library. So go to your cash app on your phone, type in H-O-P-E-G-M, all lowercase, all one word, Donate however much you want. Or if you can donate by a digital gift card, you can send it to the email that's right down here in the ticker, okay? Now, my friends, let us get to the books that we will be reading today. All right. So our first book is called... When Sadness is at Your Door. Hmm. When Sadness is at Your Door. This book is by Eva Eland. When Sadness is at Your Door. Let's find out what happens when sadness is at your door. All right. Our next book is called The Hugging Tree. Now, there is a book called The Giving Tree. I was wondering if it was by the same person, not by the same person, but that's okay. It's still a great book. The Hugging Tree, a story about resilience. This book is by Jill Meemark, illustrated by Nicole Wong. The Hugging Tree. And of course, my friends, you know, we're going to get back to them, right? Um, our friends, the Unteachables in SCS 8, that self-contained special 8th grade class. Their very uninterested teacher, Mr. Kermit. We're going to get back to finding out more about the students in this class. And what, and what else happens throughout the book. So there was a new person that came into the mix. A teacher who's down the hall, like basically like right next to Mr. Kermit's classroom with SCS 8. And I think he may know this person. So maybe today we will find out how he knows that teacher that's next door. Okay. All right. So let us get to our first book. When Sadness is at Your Door by Eva Elans. This has a dust, dust jacket, oh, and it looks the same underneath. Ta-da! <laughs> you know Miss Hope loves it. When Sadness is at Your Door by Eva Eland. And this is a Random House New York book. Sometimes, sadness arrives unexpectedly. An unexpected guest. It follows you around. a suitcase and everything and it sits so close to you you can hardly breathe Whew. that seems uncomfortable you ever had somebody sit that close to you leaning on you kind of stuff You can try to hide it. Seems too big to fit in the closet. But it feels like you've become sadness yourself. 
can kind of overwhelm me sometimes. <clears throat> Try not to be afraid of sadness. Give it a name. Listen to it. Ask where it comes from and what it means. If you don't understand each other, just sit together and be quiet for a while. But sometimes you need that. Find something that you both enjoy, like drawing. Listening to music or drinking hot chocolate. I'm up for the listening to the music and drinking hot chocolate at the same time. <laughs> Maybe sadness doesn't like to stay inside. Try letting it out sometimes. Go for a walk through the trees. You can listen to their sounds together. Kind of like our music. Maybe all it wants to know is that it is welcome. And to sleep knowing it is not alone. When you wake up, it might be gone. worry. Today is a new day. The end. Wow. What an interesting story when sadness is at your door. Now everyone's been sad before everyone this hope has been sad before i remember one thing that would help me when i was sad when i was younger is i loved music i've always loved music and so i would take all of my cds i know i know you all probably have never used cds before i know okay and so i would take all of my cds and I would take um, my little CD player and sometimes I would use the extension cord and sit it outside on my porch, have my headphones on and I would just listen to music or I would take it in my basement and sing until I was happy. So sadness isn't a feeling that you want to have because of course we all want to be happy all the time. But sometimes sadness will come in unexpectedly. Like sometimes something happens in your family or um, you have a fight with your brother or sister or your friend. Or sometimes you could just feel down and not necessarily know why. And it just comes and you're not expecting it. But it's okay to be sad sometimes. But one thing I like about this book 
is that even though it tells you to welcome sadness, also I think one thing that it's trying to tell you to do is um, to welcome someone in to help you get past your sadness. Maybe um, your brother or your sister or your mom or your dad knows that you like to draw or you like music or you like to dance. It's okay to tell them, you know, I'm not feeling that great today. I'm feeling kind of sad. Can you draw with me? Can you read a book with me? Can you dance with me? Can we have a dance party together? Um, sometimes you may not want to stay in the house. I know that around this time we've been in the house a lot. So maybe you could tell your parents or your brother or your sister or someone that you know you can be safe with while you're outside. Can we just go outside and play? Can we just go outside and sit on the step and look at the sky and play with the grass and look at the flowers? Can we just be together? Sometimes when you're dealing with sadness, all you need is for someone to sit with you. Just sit with you. Just to know that they're there and they care. You might not need to say anything. You just need the comfort of your company. So it's okay to deal with sadness, but sometimes you need someone to be with you and to help you through it. And that's okay. You don't have to fake it like you're not sad. Sometimes you can welcome it and say, you know, I'm sad, but what do I need right now? Maybe I need a hug from my mom. Maybe I need um, a kiss on the cheek from my dad. Maybe I need to play with my brother or sister. Maybe I need to call and talk to my aunt or my grandfather. Maybe I just need to sit with some music. Maybe I'd like to draw with someone in my family. All of those things are okay, but you don't have to fake it like you're not sad. It's okay to be sad. Everyone goes through it, but everyone can get through it too. My favorite part at the end is when um, it talks about acknowledging that you were sad and doing the things that you know that you need to get past it. And you go to bed and then you wake up the next day and you realize, wait a minute, I'm not sad anymore. I'm feeling pretty great about this new day. And you look outside and you wake up grateful to be alive and knowing today is a new day and I feel great. And that's what can happen because sadness doesn't last always. And then if it lasts a little longer than you would want it to, talk to someone and let them know, you know, I'm trying to get past being sad. I don't feel like it's going away. And then your parents can help you to get past that. They'll know what to do, okay? So glad we got to read that book. It's such a great book small but mighty books don't need to be long to be powerful really like that book all right our next book the hugging tree a story of resilience by jill neemark this is a imagination press book all right I read this? Not that part. All right. On a bleak and lonely rock by a vast and mighty sea grew a lonely little tree where no tree should ever be. How she got there, no one knew. She sprouted stems and little leaves as any tiny seed will do. There's hardly any dirt for me no forest breeze, no birds, no bees. But I will do the best I can to make this rock my home.
Her tiny roots pushed night and day, and bit by bit, the rock gave way. A smidge, an inch, a foot, then two. She grew and grew and grew and grew. The ocean hugged the rocky shore. I like you near me, little tree. Let's keep each other company. <laughs> Soft gold sunbeams kissed her crown, warm as honey pouring down. At night she raised her branches high to greet the moon up in the sky. I wax and wane, I ebb and flow, I cycle through from full to thin, and when I'm done, I start again. That's how life is, you know? I love watching the moon in the different phases. One summer noon, a pair of loons landed on her canopy. A pretty tree, a sparkling sea. Shall we make this place our home and raise our baby chicks right here? A little tree, the little tree warmed up with pride. She spread her branches high and wide. I'll be your home, she replied. And can you tell me if you've seen the forest where my family grew? We've built our nest in trees like you quite far from here. And so you blew many nights and many days. You flew on the wind, just like we do. So the seed for the tree flew on the wind and landed on that rock. They built a nest, they built their nest, they laid their eggs, and soon two baby chicks were born. Summer passed, autumn too. The, li the little tree turned red and gold. Then winter came with howling winds and cutting cold that broke her boughs. Oh no. Winter can be harsh. But the little tree made it through. The loons flew south, the sea all ice, the rock all snow, the moon was lost in thunderclouds. Mighty cliff, hold me tight, don't let me blow away. Little tree, with all my might, I'll hold you close, day and night. Storms will come and storms will go. At last, the sun melted the snow, but now the tree can't, could not grow. The storm had torn her roots. The moon gazed down and softly said, sometimes we lose our way, but with some help we start again. That's how life is, you know? And soon a boy came running by, skipping stones into the sea. When he saw the little tree, he stopped and stared. He touched the tiny leaves. He felt the ragged roots. He shook his head and said, I can bring just what you need. I can help you, little tree. A tree can't hug a boy. It has no hands or arms, but it can hug you with its heart. And that's just as deep and warm. The tree was grateful for the boy who wanted to help her. Every day the boy came back carrying a full backpack. From the pack, he took a tin and poured out rich brown earth. He packed the roots and tucked them in. 
he planted flowers round the tree and made a path for all to see. Now everyone will know that even on a granite cliff, a little tree can grow. And then he went to sleep and dreamed the things that boys dream of. Wow, he made that tree look pretty comfortable. With all of the grass and flowers, it'd be easy to dream under that tree. Now every day new people stop to rest beneath the little tree and dream things that we all dream of. To love, to share, to give, to dare, to grow just where we are. And to this very day, they come. Wow. Looks beautiful around the tree now. On For on a splendid sunny rock, by a warm and bright blue sea, a great big honey, hun, um, ugh, a great big hugging tree grows just where she was meant to be. Wow. The end. Wonderful. Wow. I love this book. I love this book of this little tree that was growing where no one would grow. The story of this hugging tree, like being resilient is being able to get past all types of obstacles. Because at first, everything could seem great. Everything could seem wonderful. It's just like when you're in school. You start off the school year okay, and then all of a sudden, things start getting harder. And you're just like, oh, can I make it through this? Am I gonna be able to pass? This is really hard for me to do, but, Different things come along and help you along the way. The best way to learn how to be resilient is to allow people to help you. You being there for other people and letting other people be there for you. The tree could have easily said, you know what, Granite Rock, I don't need you. I can just try to hang on by myself in the harsh winter winds. Then when the boy came up and said, you know, I can help you. The tree could have said, I don't need you to help me. I can grow strong all by myself. But no, the tree asked for help. And when someone offered help, was willing to take the help that was offered. So sometimes people think to be resilient is to handle everything on your own. No, 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 no. The best way to learn how to be resilient is to be there for other people and to allow other people to be there for you when you need them. To be able to admit, I'm struggling, I'm having a hard time. Can you help me? Yes, I can help you. Or when someone comes to offer help, gladly taking that help. So never think that you have to handle anything by yourself. In the beginning of the story, the sea loved having the tree there. The tree helped the sea to have a friend, right? Then came the, um, the loons and the loons needed a home for their new babies. The tree could have said, no, you can't stay here. I don't want you in my tree. But no, the tree was helping for a family to grow. Sure, I would love to have you here with me, okay? The tree kept the moon company so that the tree could see the different phases of the moon just like it was, it was a friend to the, sun, to the sea. 
But then when the winter winds came and were harsh on the tree, then the tree needed someone to be there for it. So it realized I can't do this on my own. Granite rock, I need you to hold on to me. And the rock was like, yes, I will help you. I will hold on as tight as I can so that you won't blow away. And then the boy came and said, you know what? I think I can help this tree. And the tree welcomed the help. So let this be a lesson to you, young ones, older young ones, adult ones. Sometimes resilience doesn't mean that you have to be able to handle everything on your own. Sometimes, many times, in order to be resilient, you gotta be willing to ask for help. And then sometimes when you didn't ask for help and someone sees that you need it and they offer it, you welcome it with open arms or open branches, okay? Oh man, two awesome books. I love these books. I have to find some more books by these two people. These books were great. So glad I got to share them with you all. So happy I got to share them. Well now, you know where we are, friends. You know where we are. To these unteachables. These two books that we just read could be a lesson to um, our unteachable friends, even the teacher, Mr. Kermit, okay? So, we just, so on Marvelous Monday, we got into chapter four, where we were learning about Aldo Braff, who seems to have some anger issues. I'm going to have to find out where those came from. And so he went in the hallway. He was upset because of something that happened in the classroom. He went in the hallway, started slamming and banging on the um, lockers. And then the teacher in room 115 came out. And she walked him back to room 117. And she talked to Mr. Kermit and... Um, Talk to him about being a bucket filler. Like if he's interrupting other people's learning, he's not being a bucket filler. He's being a bucket emptier. And some of the students didn't know what the bucket filler thing was about. But there's a book about being a bucket filler. Like filling it with encouragement, being respectful, filling someone else's bucket with good things instead of emptying out their bucket with your meanness or nastiness or inconsiderate um, actions. So it seems that Mr. Kermit may know this teacher. So this is where we are in the story trying to figure out how does Mr. Kermit know this teacher? Because he told her um, to tell her mother he said hello. How does he know her mother? Maybe we will find out today. Chapter four of The Unteachables. Okay. I wait for our teacher to give her the brush off. Good old Ribbit could brush off World War III, but for some reason, he doesn't. With great effort, he tears his eyes off her and swivels to me. Were you dipping? I stare at my sneakers. I guess. Mr. Kermit turns back to Miss Fountain. You look just like your mother. She smiles. I'll take that as a compliment. To me, she says, you should apologize to your classmates too. You wasted their learning time as well as your own. Sorry, I mumble. You know about the learning time. Relax, Raheem draws. Who learns? Thank you, Mr. Kermit, Miss Fountain says 
uncertainly. I'll give my mother your regards. Ooh, sorry, you guys, I got an itch. Woo. I'll give my mother your regards. She backs out of the room, shutting the door quietly behind her. Weird lady, Barnstorm puts in, waving a, cr a crutch dismissively. All that bucket filler stuff, like we're six years old. Hey! Mr. Kermit shoots him a sharp glance. Miss Fountain is not weird. She is a teacher. Can't she be both? Raheem wonders out loud. Kiana won't let it drop. She's not just bossy, she's nosy too. And the combination makes her like a bloodhound. What gives, Mr. Kermit? What's the deal with you and Miss Fountain? For the first time all year, he actually looks annoyed. Did I or did I not distribute worksheets? A paper airplane does a loop-the-loop -loop in front of him. There's a chorus of ribbits, including one from Elaine that sounds like it came from the underworld. Parker chimes in. Face it, Mr. K. You've barely looked away from your puzzle since school started, but the minute she shows up, you hit the ceiling. She's your kryptonite, Mateo puts in. Kiana snaps her fingers. It's her mom, right? You and Miss Fountain's must mother used to be a thing. Mr. Kermit, who couldn't even be riled by a roaring bonfire in his wastebasket, picks up his crossword puzzle, rips it in a million pieces, stomps on them, and stalks out. Even though I can't stand the guy at that moment, I actually relate to him a little bit. He may be the worst teacher in the world, but we have something in common. He has anger management problems too. Chapter five, Mr. Kermit. Emma Fountain, I can scarcely believe it. First of, I'm sorry, of all the classrooms in all the schools, she had to walk into mine. She's a time machine, that's what she is. The spitting image of her mother. It brings back memories I thought were buried forever. I can still see the engagement notice in the newspaper. Fiona Bertelsman and Zachary Kermit. The photo of the happy couple, cheek to cheek, eyebrows perfectly aligned, smiling like nothing was ever going to come and rain on our parade. How innocent we were. How blind. How foolish. It was all over in a heartbeat. The test, the scandal, the breakup. Since then, I've only seen smiles like that twice. Seven months later, when Fiona lined her eyebrows up with Gil Fountain in the engagement notices, and today, when their daughter, Emma, stepped through the doorway of room 117. Fate has a way of sticking it to you twice, resurfacing like a bad burrito. This morning was my second shot. Every day draws me 24 hours closer to early retirement, but the last lap isn't going to be a cakewalk. First Thaddeus in the Unteachables, and now Fiona's clone in the, next, in the room next door. A living, breathing, bucket-filling reminder of the life I missed out on. If that poor kid tries to teach middle schoolers the way she ran her kindergarten classes, her students will have her throat open by Columbus Day. I should sit her down and explain a few things, but that would mean I care. Caring is where the trouble starts. Hard experience taught me that. I didn't make it to the cusp of early retirement by caring. I made it by keeping my head down, regardless of whether they give me honor students or unteachables or the zombie apocalypse. All I have to do is endure. There are small satisfactions. The hiss of the air-controlled closing of the school entrance behind me as I exit the building. The crunch of my shoes on the bad pavement of the parking lot. 
the stab of pain in my sore shoulder as I opened the ill-fitting door of my 1992 Chrysler Concord. The one Fiona and I bought to start our new life together. Sky blue, although now it's mostly rust. I don't know why I've kept it so long. For sure, it isn't the money. The repair bills alone would have brought me a Lamborghini. I turn the key in the ignition and the motor coughs and dies. A few minutes later, the hood is open and I'm staring in at who knows what. Suddenly, there's a screech of tires and a pickup truck is reversing across the parking lot at top speed, hurtling toward me. My one thought is that if I'm crushed to death here and now, Dr. Thaddeus and the school district won't ever have to pay for my early retirement. The pickup roars to a stop with its rear bumper six inches from my leg. Eyes blazing, I shout, are you crazy? The door opens and the driver gets out. I blink. It's one of my students. I know the Unteachables are a rough crowd, but I never expected one of them to steal a truck and use it to try to kill me. Sorry, the gas pedal sometimes sticks a little. When my shocked expression doesn't fade, the kid adds, It's me, Parker, from class. What can I do to help? To start with, I rasp, you can stop reversing at 90 miles an hour. Why is a middle schooler driving at all? As he launches into a whole story about his grandmother, the family farm, a provisional license, I conjure up a picture of him in a front row desk, examining worksheets from point blank range like he's staring through a jeweler's eyepiece. Wow, that's a pretty old car, he tells me. I mean, mine's old, but yours is like classic. He squints at the name in the raised chrome letters. It's a... Oh, oh, nerd. Concord, I correct impatiently. Didn't anyone ever teach this point of read? Never mind that. Any idea how I can get it started up again? Give Parker credit. He's better with cars than he is with words. He tinker, tinkers around under the hood, and pretty soon the motor is running again. Although it's belching gray smoke all over the parking lot. Stop it. A silver Prius pulls alongside. The window is open, and through the billowing clouds, we can just make out Miss Rona Fountain. Turn it off! Turn it off! Parker rushes behind the wheel and kills the engine. She gets out of the Prius, waving her arms to clear the air. Do you have any idea how much carbon is in that smoke? Miss Bar Vardalos is the chemistry teacher, I replied, deliberately misunderstanding the point she was trying to make. I'm in charge of, well, you know which class I'm in charge of, I indicated Parker with a slight nod. I'm bucket filling, Parker tells her proudly. You know, helping Mr. Ribbit, I mean, Kermit. Mr. Kermit, she asked, how old is this car? Your mother picked it out, I informed her with an oddly defiant smile. Her eyes widen. Oh, wow, that's old. It's just that people didn't understand emissions back then. It was before everyone started putting the environment first, recycling, composting, installing solar panels. A long speech forms in my mind about how this is a free country and it's none of our business what anybody drives or how old it is or what it spews into the atmosphere. But for some reason, I can't say it. Not to her, not to that face that looks so much like the illness. She softens. Well, maybe you can keep it, but you definitely have to put in a catalytic converter. It's on my list, I assure her right after a new floor for the back seat, just in case I ever had passengers. Parker peeks into the back. Whoa, is that the ground? Air conditioning, I supply tight-lipped, old school. Emma regards me with pity. On the plus side, she and Parker managed to get the motor running again, minus the smoke this time. 
Wow, Miss Fountain, Parker Reeves, you're really good with cars. I learned from my mom, she explains. She took a course in auto mechanics because she bought a real lemon once and her voice trails off as she frowns at the old Concord connecting the dots. I swallow what's left of my pride. Thanks for your help. I'm positive that her first act after getting home will be to call her mother and say, Ma, guess what? He still got that car. The calendar appears in my mind. That magical date in June circled in gold sharpie. Only 172 more days of school to go. Chapter 6, Mateo Hendrickson. When I get really bored, which is every day, I match people I know with characters from TV and movies. For example, my sister Lauren is like Venom from Spider-Man because she's evil and spits poison. Well, not literally, but since I invented the classification system, I get to choose who's what. Just don't tell my mom, because she's like Professor McGonagall from Harry Potter. Smart and usually fair, but she can be nasty when it's something ticks her off, like me comparing Lauren to a Spider-Man home. It works for the kids at school too. Parker is like Lightning Queen because he's the only kid who drives. Barnstorm is the Flash since he has since he was such a great athlete before the wound before he wound up on crutches. Raheem is a little tricky. But I think of him as Birdman because he has really big ears that can easily expand into wings if he gets bitten by a radioactive canary. Crazy, I know, but in comics, that kind of thing happens all the time. Anyway, I can always switch him to Sleeping Beauty. He's not that beautiful, but he is that sleeping. Elaine is a cross between Chewbacca from Star Wars and Lois Lane, who also rhymes with pain. I try not to get too close to her. She once picked a kid up by the belt and used his head to poke at the fluorescent light that was buzzing. Kiana is blonde phantom, since they're both from California, even though Kiana's hair is closer to light brown. And Aldo, that's easy. He's Bruce Banner, who turns into the Incredible Hulk when he gets mad. As for me, I'm part Hobbit and part Vulcan, Bilbo and Spock, big logic in a small package. That leaves just our teacher, Mr. Colonel. He's tough to characterize. I'm learning, I'm leaning towards Squidward because when he comes to class in the morning, he reminds me of Squidward coming to work at the Krusty Krab, bored and bummed out. And he treats us the way Squidward treats the customers. He doesn't hate us exactly, but he definitely wishes we were someplace else. He's even a little grumpier than Squidward because he doesn't have a hobby like playing the clarinet, unless you count crossword puzzles and consuming mass quantities of coffee. For someone who's supposed to be a teacher, he sure doesn't do much teaching. He mostly just hands out worksheets. The only time he talks is when someone asks a question. That usually ends up being me. Mr. Kermit, why do the magnetic poles reverse? Without effort, the teacher tears his attention away from his puzzle. Excuse me? Every 200 and 5,000 years, Earth's magnetic poles reverse, I explain. I was just wondering why that happens. Yes, but what does it have to do with, reluctantly, he glances from his New York Times to the worksheet on the desk beside it, using vocabulary words in a sentence. I want to do a sentence on Magneto, I reason, but since his superpower is magnetism, and electric charge, he'd be affected by that. That's another thing about Mr. Kermit. He isn't very helpful when one of his students is curious about something. The only other time there are questions is when Parker is trying to figure out what a word is. 
that turns into a game, into a kind of a game in SCS 8, figuring out what he means by tremgully when the word is really metallurgy. Sometimes the whole class gets in on guessing. It's the only fun we have during school. It can get pretty loud when people start laughing at Parker. Mr. Kermit's usually okay with it, unless Miss Fountain comes over to complain that we're disturbing her class. Then he chews at us. He doesn't get mad at us, but he can't stand it, and she does. But this one time, this one time, Barnstorm makes a big stink pounding on his desk with both crutches because the football team is holding its first pep rally and he isn't going to be up there with the players. It's not fair, man, he roars. Just because I'm injured doesn't mean I'm not a golden eagle. Mr. Kermit's curiosity is suddenly piqued. If you were in the pep rally, you'd have to leave right now. You'd have to leave now, right? You'd be somewhere else for the rest of the day. Barnstorm nods. The team gets the whole afternoon off to prepare for it, and I'm stuck here working. That might be pushing it a little. I've seldom seen Barnstorm, Barnstorm pick up a pencil. That sounds reasonable to me, Mr. Kermit agrees. It isn't your fault you got injured. Why should you have to suffer for it? I get the feeling that Mr. Kermit doesn't care much about justice for Barnstorm. What he really wants is to get this disturber of the peace out of the room, out of room 117, before he puts one of those crutches through the wall. Miss Fountain would definitely notice that. So he goes on the intercom and demands to have Barnstorm included in the rally. He argues his way through three secretaries and the assistant principal, and he won't take no for an answer. We're blown away. It's a whole new side of our teacher none of us has seen before. He's actually fighting for one of us, when we would have bet money that he barely even noticed we were here. Put me through to Clo Coach Slattery, Mr. Kerman insists. He's in class right now, comes the reply from the speaker. Well, get him out of class, our teacher retorts. Justice and fairness aren't just part of the social studies curriculum, you know. They're the building blocks of our entire society. No one is more amazed than Barnstorm himself. That's what I'm talking about, he approves in a satisfied tone. By the time Mr. Kermit gets on the athletic, on with the athletic office, he's really worked up. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, he accuses Coach Slattery. You send these kids out there to be tackled and elbowed and hit with hockey sticks, and when they get injured, you abandon them. When the coach finally breaks down and says, okay, whatever, send him down, the whole class breaks into applause. You were awesome, Mr. Kermit, Kiana explains. exclaims. You should be in the Justice League, I add. He looks startled, as if he didn't realize anyone was listening. He turns to Barnstorm. Well, off you go. Enjoy your... His voice trails off. Pep rally, I supply helpfully. Barnstorm is already thump swinging toward the door. Thanks, Mr. Kermit. Throughout the afternoon, our teacher keeps looking at Barnstorm's empty desk and smiling. Another first for him. And at the end of the day, when we were called down to the pep rally, he smiles all the way to the auditorium, even though our class is always terrible marching through the hallways. Aldo karate kicks lockers and Rahim stakes out a water fountain so he can spray people. This seventh grade class gives Elaine a hard time about blocking the chairs, but only till he realizes who he's talking to. Better to be blocked on the stairs than to take a one-way trip down them or to have a classroom door slammed on your head or any of the other things Elaine does to people who annoy her. 
The kid apologizes and gets out of there so fast that he slams into Parker and they both end up blocking the stairs for real. Not even that spoils Mr. Kermit's mood. It's a problem. He's much too happy to be Squidward now. Until we reach the auditorium. We're standing there waiting for our turn to file in when an ear-splitting honk goes off right behind us. Mr. Kermit practically hits the ceiling. He wheels around to see this kid with a bright green Vuvuzela, which is one of those noisemakers that look like a long plastic trumpet. They're still, they're, I'm sorry, they're kind of a tradition for Golden Eagle sports because one of our school band members is from South Africa where they were invented. Without a word, Mr. Kermit snatches the thing out of the kid's hand, throws it to the floor, and stomps it flat. The boy looks at him, lip quivering, but it's a pep rally. Who says pep can't be quiet? The teacher's furious eyes fixed on a girl who's holding a purple one. Don't even think about it. Nervously, she whisks the instrument behind her back. Mr. Kermit nods. That's the spirit. Problem solved. He's Squidward again. When it comes to the Vuvuzelas, he might even be Lex Luthor. At the pep rally, they make us sit in the back, just in case we have to be kicked out. Our class always sits in the back, even in the cafeteria. The teachers don't want us anywhere near the soda machine. They, give, they think giving us sugar is like sprinkling water on gremlins. I cheer when Barnstorm is introduced. I've never known anybody on a team before. He waves a crutch in our direction, and a few of the other kids clap too. Then Rahim falls asleep. His head slumps over and crunks a girl sitting next to him. We get kicked out. <laughs> All right, we will end there. So, uh, Mr. Kermit was engaged to Miss, um, Miss Fiona, what is her last name? What is her last name? Fountain. Miss Fiona, Miss Fountain. She was... He was engaged to Miss Fountain's mother way back before um, Miss Fountain was even born. So that's why he's like, oh, I have to be on my P's and Q's around her. So, and he stands up for Barnstorm. Maybe Miss Fountain is helping him to have some feeling towards his students. Maybe it made him feel pretty good to stand up for him, to get him into the pep rally. We're going to learn some more about all these different people. And I wonder if Mrs. Um, Fiona Fountain was a teacher too. I wonder. Let's find out why everything ended between them. Okay, so we will find out more about that on our fabulous Friday. Hello, Jocelyn. I'm so happy that you got to be on with us today. Well, my friends, so glad to have had the opportunity and the pleasure of reading these wonderful books with you today about it being okay to be sad sometimes. And it's okay to need help um, when you are trying to hold on in hard um, times. You need help when you're feeling sad sometimes. And sometimes you need help to hold on when things are not going quite the way you want them to go. We learn about that in this book too. All the books went together today. It was awesome. So I look forward to seeing you again on our fabulous Friday, which will be the last day of school for school district schools. I look forward to seeing you right back here on this Hopes of reading hour. Until then, my friends, until Fabulous Friday, I will see you next time.